with Ash Ola. Hi guys, welcome back to Waxing Lyrical from the Symposium, our music series. Um, today we're, we've got another four albums to review. Um, before we do that, we'll have a brief chat about what we've been listening to as usual and maybe touch on some of the controversial Kanye stuff from the last few days. Um, and then, as usual, we'll review the albums and then finally talk briefly about what we're going to listen to in the upcoming week. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to again be joined by Jay, Arjun and Cameron. Arjun, how are you? I'm very good, thanks. Looking forward to seeing this podcast, as usual. Yeah. Jay, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Excited to hear your thoughts on my album. Yeah. Cameron, how are you? Oh, never better, thank you. Although I I must admit, carrying on from last week, after listening to that latest 1975 album, my mood was dampened a substantial (laughs) amount, but I'm safe to say I've recovered now. Okay, no, it's always good to hear. Um, Yeah, so before we jump into the albums... um, Arjun, talk to me about Kanye's recent um, activities. Oh, well, it's just Kanye being Kanye. Um, I don't, my opinions on it have changed a lot with every tweet that he puts out. Right now, I'm just focusing on the music. That's what I'm in- interested in. So he obviously tweeted out the um, album cover for the album Donda with Child, as, as it's now called, subject, subject to Change, of course. And I really like the album cover. It's really like sort of psychedelic. It seems to be like having this bit of kids see ghost influence. And my reasoning and my hope is that with an album cover that good, surely the music has to match match it and be good as well. Yeah. But I know that you have a lot of thoughts about his other tweets. So I'd be interested to hear what you think of those. Yeah, I mean, um, it was all a bit hectic. He called out Kim Kardashian, accused her of cheating. And then now he's apologised and he kind of just had a, a kind of meltdown on, on Twitter. I mean, Jay, what did you make of the whole thing? It's kind of hard to say. It's like, um, I mean, the thing is, I think if you notice a lot of the the kind of fan base are trying to kind of make these, they're all kind of trying to stand by him and insult Kim, which I think is just completely uncalled for. I think the issue is, is that there's obviously kind of a domestic issue going on and Kanye is having all these personal issues. And I think if you really kind of like him as a person, then I think you should step back and stop trying to kind of tell people stop trying to act like you know the guy and just accept that he probably does need to get some help and I'm sure his family know what they're doing and let, let them work it out for themselves rather yeah, than try and make the, it a big media stunt. The issue with that is that's that's fair enough to say but the fact that they're airing it out all publicly means that as fans and as people viewing this it's quite easy for us to read into it because of the fact that it's so public whereas if it was private and we, we didn't know anything about yeah. them there'd be less speculation. I mean, the fact it's so public also make, implies to me slightly that they want they want us. To you say opinion. that Kim didn't say anything until a couple of days, and she probably only said it because people were kind of pressurizing her to it. And I think to an extent, she almost you know she's one of those people who just can't win. If she didn't say anything, it'll go, oh, she's a bitch. If she said something, it'll go, oh, she's just doing it for publicity. She's exploiting him. Yeah. So it's it's one of those situations. I think I do actually feel bad for her. I feel really bad for her. It's just. I think she seems actually like she's someone who's gone up in my uh, estimations a lot over the years. Um, And I think she's in a difficult position, but I'm sure she's doing well and she's doing what's right by him. Fair enough. Cameron, what did you make of it? Uh, I am a bit of a massive cynic at heart, so (laughs) I do find it coincidental how all these outbursts and uh, weird Twitter rants do seem to coincide with his album releases. But so I find it a bit hard to get too invested in it for that reason. It becomes more like, uh, you know, watching TMZ than actually appreciating music. I like to just stay focused on what his output is. But, I mean, obviously, if the guy's going through some hard times, uh, I hope he gets the help he needs. Uh, I think it's bipolar disorder I think he might uh, be diagnosed with. So, yeah, obviously, I, I feel very empathetic uh, to, to that if, if, if he's going through it. Um yeah, I think he's got a bit of a history, though, of timing his album releases and the themes in his albums with his sort of personal traumas. Uh, obviously, 808s and Heartbreak, a uh, fantastic album came out right after the death of his mother. Um, uh, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy followed a breakup. Uh, you know, these themes are recurring in, in, in Kanye's discography. So if he can turn it into a great album, then, you know, 
that's that's fantastic. But yeah, if he's going through some hard stuff personally, then yeah, obviously I hope he gets the help he needs. No, that's a that's a good and mature answer. Um, moving on then, Arjun, what have you been listening to um, this week? Um, so yeah, if I were to pick up a few highlights, so as you know, I've been slowly listening to Jay Z's discography now that it's put up on Spotify. I think yeah. January or December. Yeah. And so I moved on to his eighth or ninth album. I, it's quite hard to keep track. There's so many. Kingdom Come, um, 2006. This was like his comeback album after. Yeah, I actually I quite like that album. Yeah, and I enjoyed it as well. I, I found it. To be honest, I think it was his weakest album that I've listened to, but I, I still did enjoy it. It's a very solid um, album. I also finally listened to Mad Villainy after like three years of not hearing it. Um, that was an insane album to listen to. Really fun experience. And I basically got motivated to listen to it after you guys started talking about it last week in the podcast. So I listened to that for the first time in years and great again. Um, I also listened to Channel Orange with you, which was very interesting. I quite liked it. I thought it was better than Blonde. Um, obviously, Channel Orange by Frank, Frank Ocean. I, I actually, no, I actually do agree that it's better than Blonde, but I think Jay would disagree with us. Mm. Yeah, I um, disagree. <laughs> and then um, one album that I really enjoyed, probably my favourite album this week, was um, by a hip hop group called Compton's Most Wanted. Now, when you think of sort of West Coast hip hop um, groups from the 90s, you probably think of NWA first, um, but I'd argue that Compton's Most Wanted are better. Um, they produce more albums. Um, yeah, they have a better output, and that this this album, Music to Drive, by their third album, but um, in 1992, is, is just insane. Every single track there is a banger. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And their lead, um, their lead frontman, MC8. Um, you may know him from Kendrick Lamar's Good Kid, Mad City, the feature yes. on the song yes. Mad City. Yeah, yes. he's like a hip hop veteran. Released like. I think about 16 albums, solo albums, as well as his work with Compton's Most Wanted. So I'll be sort of listening to him and, and that group, like, you know, over the next couple of months is getting into them because I really enjoyed their albums so far. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's what I've been listening to other than that. Those are the highlights of what I've been listening to other than the albums that we're going to focus on this week. Yeah. Jay, what about you? And also, Jay, briefly, just tell us in like a sentence, why do you think Blonde is better than Channel Orange? Um... I think my issue, okay, I can't say this in a sentence, but I'll say it quickly. I think my issue with Channel Orange is there's a lot of great songs on it, but I feel like pretty much every great song has got kind of a weaker version of it on the same record. Okay. Um, which I don't think is the case with Blonde. I think Blonde kind of everything fits in there and makes sense. There's nothing I think, oh, this could kind of be cut and it wouldn't really hurt anyone. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Okay, yeah, sorry. So what have you been listening to this week? Um, I think... My highlights of this week have been, uh, first of all, I finally got around to listening to Death Grips. I listened to The Money Store. Right. Which I thought was such a fucking good album. It was just like, they're basically just screaming at you for an hour um, with kind of no melody or anything, but I really liked it. I thought it was, you know, a good kind of intense, you know, listen that kind of just punches you in the face. Um, I also listened to, because it was released on the 24th and I was hyped to listen to Kanye's new album, I instead ended up listening to Taylor Swift's new album, Folklore, which people have been raving over um, on, you know, loads of websites. And I don't know why, because it's absolutely crap. It's really fucking boring. It's well over an hour long. It's all boring indie songs that all sound the same. There's a couple of songs, I guess, that are quite nice, but it's pretty much all the same. It's really uninteresting. It's kind of, imagine a mixture of Lana Del Rey and Bonnie Iver, but boring, uninteresting, and twice as long as most of their albums. And you you kind of got what Taylor Swift's new album is. It's, it's a bit shit. I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, Cameron, what about you? I know that you're a Death Grips fan as well. Uh, yeah, I absolutely adore Death Grips, so uh, I'm very happy to see that Jay's getting into them. Uh, my favourite record of theirs is probably uh, The Powers That Be, specifically the second half of it, Jenny Death. I really like the metal, uh, punky atmosphere they bring to the table with that one. It's a bit of a switch up in their genre. Uh, in the last week specifically, I uh, well, as I sort of stated, I listened to the latest 1975 album, which I won't spend too much time explaining why, but mm -hmm. it's very bloated, it's overproduced. The lacks any cohesive theme. They try to really evoke all these different emotions and genres and fail spectacularly on every single one. So it's a terrible album. Uh, on a more positive note, genre-wise, I have been. I wish you told us how you really felt. 
I, I I know I know it's like uh, I I like to uh, I like to sugarcoat things, don't I? <laughs> but on a more positive note, I've been getting into a genre which I've long neglected for a while, and that is a uh, new Deutsche Welle or new German wave. It uh, sort of was contemporaneous with new wave and synth pop in the early 80s, but obviously it's a German variant of it. Is that the kind uh, of West Berlin style? It is kind of West Berlin. You'll know like artists like Nina and yes. Falco, yeah, um, yeah. but obviously yeah. some of the more underground ones like um, Ish und Ish and uh, Peter Schilling. Right. Some great stuff there. I've actually it's been watching a Netflix uh, series recently called Dark, the whole concept of which is time travel between the uh, 1980s and present day. So it uses a lot of that music in the soundtrack. And it's a it's really good genre. I'd, I'd recommend it highly. Yeah, Cameron, I think that links to the... Um... I think that links to the Charlie Theron film Atomic Blonde, which is basically she's some kind of super, like superwoman in in like 1980s Germany. Mm, yeah, I've I've never actually seen that film, but based off my recent listening hours, I think I might have to check it out. Yeah, I mean, Jay, have you seen it? No, it's been one of those things that I've kind of had bookmarks on like Sky Movies for years. I've just never actually got around to pressing yeah. play. I mean, the reviews of it, the reviews on it aren't like, you know, outstanding, whatever. But I just thought it linked quite interestingly yeah. to quite a niche, niche genre of music that Cameron identified there. Mm. Um, in, in terms of what I've been listening to, um, obviously, I've listened to an um, album. I listened to Channel Orange with Arjun. I'm continuing my 90s hip hop um, that I've been doing for the last few weeks. I listened to a couple of Radiohead albums, actually. And I've listened, I've tried to listen to uh, quite a few indie, classic British indie albums in preparation for listening to Little Comets again for this pod. So I've listened to some of the Kooks, Bombay Bicycle Club, Future Heads, Early Arctic Monkey stuff, um, just stuff like that, really. And it it all links to my kind of indie playlist on Spotify, uh, which I might link in the description of a future pod um, if we do like an indie pod. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I've been listening to. So yeah, um, thanks for all those contributions. Let's move on to the actual album reviews then. So I chose In a Search of Elusive Little Comets by Little Comets. Arjun, you chose? Yeah, I chose Every Hero Needs a Villain by Starface. Jay? I did uh, Trout Mask Replica by Captain Beefheart and his magic band. Okay, and Cameron? Uh, I chose The Lexicon of Love by ABC. Right. Um, we'll just go in that order then. So I guess I'll go first. Um, this is an album I really like. Um, it's in a kind of classic British indie style. Little Comets are a band from northeast, kind of Newcastleish area. Um, this album I think was in a dispute with Columbia Records, um, but they managed to get free of the record company. And um, yeah, I, I, and I and I, I yeah, I just really enjoy the album. On first listen, it's a classic whimsy kind of British indie album. But there are some songs which get, you know, quite deep and dark, like Intelligent Animals, etc. Um, that Jay's, you know, spoken to me about and said that he really enjoyed. I like some of the more upbeat classic indie tracks like One Night in October, Adultery, Joanna, Dancing Song. But yeah, the album, I think, is quite ambitious and is far more ambitious than your average kind of troped out um, indie or indie rock kind of album. Um, I also chose it because it's quite different to most other albums that we've done so far on the pod. We've not really done much of this genre and it is quite a large genre. I know that Jay and Cameron um, specifically are, you know, reasonable fans fans of it. Both of them have contributed to my indie playlist. Um, so, yeah, I just, I just thought it would be a good album to listen to. And the track One Night in October especially is one of my long-term favourite songs that I've liked for many, many years. Um, Arjun, what did you think of it? Because this isn't kind of the music that you'd normally listen to. Yeah, out of choice. I would never listen to this sort of music out of choice. But when it is offered to me and presented to me, I enjoy it. Um yeah, I I I, fed, I quite like this album. I thought it was decent. I'm not. I I gave it a three out of five. I think, or yeah, I gave it a three out of five. It was decent. It I. The, my first thoughts when listening to it was it's the sort of music that I would expect to her like you know like on an old sort of FIFA soundtrack like FIFA 10 or FIFA 11 where they no they literally used, yeah they it's used like to FIFA, have like yeah, yeah like they FIFA have, or like, made in Chelsea those kind yeah, of yeah literally like, they used to have yeah. all these sort of their playlists the soundtrack was full of like indie songs. And, you know, I, I imagine that's how lots of people got into indie music is by listening to those sort of soundtracks. And that's basically what it reminds me of. Um, yeah, but I, I enjoyed the album. I thought in terms of my favourite song, the final song, Intelligent Animals, was quite good because it was so different to the others in that it basically, from what I understood, it was just like critiquing or just talking about the genocide in, in Darfur. Um, that's what I got when I looked it up because I was so like intrigued by it. But... Yeah, I, I think it's it's a fairly standard um, indie album, but I guess when you look at the lyrics, 
they're, they're maybe a bit more deep than you'd expect. Yeah, that's quite a nice, quite nice insight. Um, Jay, what are your thoughts? I mean, I agree with Arjun in terms of intelligent animals being the strongest on the album. Um, one kind of maybe a criticism I had though is that I felt that something like intelligent animals kind of just came out of fucking nowhere on the album, both kind of sonically and lyrically. You know, like there was a whole kind of thread throughout of it kind of being this kitchen sink kind of indie album about you know, standard kind of social issues with, um, there's a song about re- the recession, there's a song about abuse, there's about, uh, you know, adultery, um, c- relationships falling. You know, it's, it's quite ambitious, as you say, in terms of its uh, content. Um, I thought there was maybe a bit of a mishmash and that some of the kind of, some of the songs, like Intelligent Animals, although they were really good songs, I don't necessarily get what it was doing on this album. Um, that's just kind of me because I like, you know, an album to be quite cohesive. I've said that a few times. Um, I thought it was a good album, though. I thought, you know, you've got songs like Adultery, One Night in October, Dancing Song, which is just very catchy, especially One Night in October. That's kind of, it's playing in my head now as, of t- as I talk about it. Um, I thought it was, you know, these guys were ambitious, especially considering it's their debut album. I think they're dealing with themes that are more interesting than, you know, what other people are doing in indie music. And I think definitely on a song like Intelligent Animals, that in particular makes me want to listen to more of what they've got to see if they've kind of channeled that ambition and seeing if they can take it further and maybe make an album that, you know, go, moves beyond kind of conventional indie sound and goes into something kind of new and exciting. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's all fair. I mean, I kind of like it because it straddles, um, so it's not as abstract or indie as something like Neutral Milk Hotel or, or Beach House, but it's yeah. less conventional than something like the Wombats or Bombay Bicycle Club. It's kind, yeah. of, in, it's kind of in between those, which kind I of made, like, meant that I, I, like, I like that yeah. kind of balance. Like her black eyes as well. That was another song that really stood out to me because that's obviously again it's one of the darker songs, but it's got this kind of almost a jolly sound to it, which I I thought was interesting though as well. It's there's it's like one of those albums where you listen to it once and you're like oh this is a nice little happy album, and then you kind of pay a bit of attention like oh that's a bit dark, isn't it? Fair enough, um, Cameron. Uh, I think I might be alone in this opinion from every, based on all everyone else's responses, but I found this album quite disappointing personally. I could never really get into it. Uh, I think for me, it's because it typifies the what is, in my opinion, the near death of British indie music post Britpop, with the exception of Arctic Monkeys. It sounded to me too generic uh like it was just another wombat or bombay bicycle clubs or the libertines or the kooks it sounded like a pale imitation of better bands but then again for my personal taste i don't even particularly like that the the better bands your, your sort of garage revival stuff uh again with the exception of maybe the arctic monkeys and franz ferdinand i i i i don't particularly take to this genre even on its own without my personal biases I didn't think the songwriting on this was strong enough to deal with some of the themes that were uh that he attempted to tackle I also in particular found his voice uh just quite unattractive uh, as, as a listener it was that I call it, a lot of people do think that actually. I, I call it the British indie yelp that he seems to use intermittently throughout this and i I, I just couldn't get into it. I, I can appreciate that it, it's a bit of a, a funky, boppy record, but no, it, it didn't have enough cohesion or lasting impact to make me want to come back to it. I, I'd have to give this one a four or five out of ten for me. It, it didn't didn't do it for me. No, fair enough. I mean, I think I take, I think I agree with actually most of what you say, but I'm just like, I'm just bothered about it kind of less, I guess, because I like the genre more than you do. So I think I completely agree with you that the writing. Um, is is like nothing special and it often falls short of the of the kind of gravity of what of the topics are trying to handle i mean outside of intelligent animals um i don't i think like adultery as a tune is quite a nice boppy tune with like kind of indie indie pop and you know and and, and use of kind of electronic and conventional sound but but you know the writing and what they're saying at all you know doesn't doesn't like lead to, lead to something new or interesting being said about adultery or any yeah. kind of per, any kind of personal input mm. um i kind of like it though in spite of that because i i personally am i personally do enjoy the music of like the libertines future heads the kooks especially you know i think the kooks have have um one album that it, that's really enjoyable but um 
Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree with you to the extent that I think the Arctic Monkeys' early work is probably the best British indie of recent years. Um, I've kind of fallen out of love with some of their later work, but yeah, no, I, I think I agree with your a lot of what you say. Just I think I think less severely. Um, I think all your all your points are well taken. Um, Cameron, so are there other kind of so are the Arctic Monkeys truly the only kind of modern I- British indie band that you like? Uh, I'd say there's maybe three that I could pick out uh, for, for, from that era. Uh, I would pick out the Arctic Monkeys, uh, the Fratellis and Franz Ferdinand. I think actually UK India has seen a bit of a revival in, in recent years. Uh, I'm thinking of bands like Shame, Idols, Fontaine's DC. They've sort of used that post, post-punk revival, if you'll allow the term, uh, and, and really sort of galvanised that revival there. Uh, but from the mid 2000s era, yeah, I can only think of those three. The rest I see as purely a derivative, uh, sort of d- d- quite derivative. No real strong songwriting. Again, I, I'm I'm contrasting this continuously with uh, the American indie scene at the time, which I think was leaps and bounds ahead. Uh, yeah, especially with people like Vampire Weekend, etc. Exactly, Vampire Weekend, LCD Sound System. There, they've got the songwriting, the like you say, the ability to tackle these serious themes with much more gravity. And it's not that they're excruciatingly bad bands. Uh, the these other acts. It's just that they they pale in comparison to me to other people who I would much rather listen to and come back to. So it's it's a lot of repeat value that I think is lacking for me. Maybe I'll do Modern Vampires of the City next week to try and defend the uh, indie genre <laughs> again and, and maybe you know, <laughs> I, I do adore resurrect, that album. resurrect its reputation in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you guys for listening to it. I, I do enjoy the album. Um, I think Cameron's points are well taken, however, and Jay as well. I mean, all of you have said that it's, it's kind of a nothing def, nothing genre defining um, or anything that you really special. But yeah, I do think yeah. I enjoy some of the whimsical songs on it. And to be fair um, to them as well. Yeah. So yeah, go on. Like, to be fair to them, it is also their debut album because I mean I was kind of sitting on Cameron's side. But I was thinking, well, you know, you've got songs like One Night in October, you've got songs like Dancing Song, which I feel like to an extent they're almost just there to kind of you know give it some pop appeal and maybe get some songs out there that people will kind of you know listen to and that might make the charts. In contrast with kind of slightly more ambitious songs like Intelligent Animals, which you know is never going to be fucking number one on on any uh, chart out there. So I thought that maybe they did a respectable job at trying to battle, uh, trying to balance, you know, between more conventional and maybe trying to be a bit more unconventional and groundbreaking, even if I don't think it was. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, again, I'd say like the kind of best example of of an album that that really does balance the tackling of heavy themes with kind of um, pop appeal is probably um, whatever people say I am, that's what I'm not by the Arctic Monkeys um that probably what i think is their probably one of their probably their best album and i think you know, that that balances you know they have like tough songs like you know mardi bum or when the sun goes down but then they have like actual bangers like i bet you look good on the dance floor etc um so i think that's kind of the standard that you should hold this album to which, which see, means that it's, it's quite hard to hold them to the standard i think this is better than that album really i, I actually think Ooh. that's quite <laughs> no jay no i even i chose this album i'm not, I'm not saying I think... that I think my issue is Arctic Monkeys to me is I don't actually think they've got much in the way of musical talent and a lot of their songs just sound like noise. It kind of almost sounds like something like Busted would put out in the TV. It's just kind of a bunch of idiots strumming on guitars and making noise. Whereas this at least that's has got some so rhythm deep. to it. Hey, that's, that's, that's a very hot take. That's a, that's a, that is a hot take. That's that an hot inflaming take. take. I, I mean, can't I, get into this album, into whatever people say. Cameron, keep f- Cameron you should... Uh, do you have anything to say to rebut Jay's statement there that 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 in search of a lucid little comet is not as good as as Arctic Monkeys record? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a bit lost for words for the first time. Uh, no, I again I would try and contextualise it at the at, at the time British indie uh, post post strokes I would say uh, when American indie was starting to make waves uh, in progressing the genre forward. After Britpop, British indie didn't really go anywhere for quite a while. And the Arctic Monkeys, to their credit, did take it out of that so, uh, that, that, that death nail by introducing this fresh new sound, building upon their influences. You see in the Arctic Monkeys work influences uh, as diverse as uh, the Kinks, the Jam, even going forward and obviously into Britpop. They utilised that and they presented these really well-crafted songs t- dealing with some, uh, uh, you know, quite challenging themes. 
And it's natural then that bands after that would want to emulate that success and try to repeat it or, you know, just use them as an influence as the Arctic Monkeys use their influences. Where I think this album and the other albums in that genre fall short is that it becomes less of an influence and just purely derivative. They try to do what they do. They don't have the songwriting ability. I mean, you criticize the Arctic Monkeys songwriting ability. Okay, maybe it's not. Like, we'll get onto it later. Maybe it's no trout mask replica, but they do manage. <laughs> they, Arctic Monkeys, they do manage to present these quite tight, these tight, well produced. No, you're, songs. You're, I think you're right. To be fair, um, yeah. I mean, I will, I'll leave Jay's take there to cool down, um, and I'll finish my segment just by saying I think every indie record after 1970 is merely a pale B Tech imitation of Velvet Underground and Nico. So I'll just leave that there. And um, yeah, let's move on. Um, Arjun. Hi. So my album was Every Hero Needs a Villain by Starface. Now this is the second album by um, this hip hop super group. So this is form this this group is formed um, um, this is formed of um, Wu Tang Clan member Inspector Deck and the legendary hip hop duo of, of Seven L and Esoteric, who are quite, uh, quite famous in the underground. Now. It's hard to look at this album without taking MF Doom into account. Um, the product, the project's basically based on what he's been doing for years, that it feels almost like a spin-off. Um, but I think this is a really fun album, um, helped by Seven L's production, which is like really like hyper, energetic, fun, with lots of great samples and loops throughout. Um, and then married with the classic East Coast boom bap of Inspector Deck, who represents the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, and his contributions here basically are reminiscent of the top tier um, Wu Tang Clan um, albums and songs of the 90s, and I think it's it's just a really really fun album, which doesn't disappoint at all. Um, 15 tracks, um, and all of them sort of flow by. My only real criticism of this album would be that the hyped MF Doom feature seems a bit lazy. He seems to almost stumble across his ver- uh, his words in the verse. I, he almost seems to be slurring his words, which I think. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but I just found it I found it a bit of an awkward listen. But in general the album was really fun. Um the rhymes are really sharp and the flow the flows from both the rappers are really good as well. And it's yeah, it's a really fun album with lots of tons of movie samples and um yeah, great album, I think. I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. I mean, um firstly I I I'll just go first. I, I think I generally massively agree. Obviously I've listened to Mad Villainy, M Food um world War villain stuff and obviously 36 chambers all very recently so i've got a lot of wu-tang and mf doom in my mind um in the last uh week or couple of weeks um so this was a nice continuation of that as you say um i liked the songs junkyard dogs and nightcrawler because they had you know quality samples as you say it kind of echoed classic um mf doom production or even kind of wu-tang production i.e sampling you know just kind of movie characters talking about violence which is always kind of welcome in these kind of records um i enjoyed um when gods go bad because jazza from um wu-tang was on it and i think he as usual performed well um his bars were crisp he, he actually kind of seemed to do a kind of mf doom eighth or 16th bar type of um flow which i thought was quite welcome on the beats that were chosen um I also thought Inspector Deck, another um, Wu Tang, another erstwhile member of the Wu Tang Clan, was um, also very good on that specific track. Um, when Gods Go Bad, um, yeah, MF Doom came on on I think Kabang, and um, having just listened to Mid Villainy or Wardville Villain or M Food, his his bars do seem to be quite lazy compared to those very tight, tightly written albums with a very controlled flow. This did seem, seem to be slightly lazy. Whether that's intentional or not, only he will know. But based on kind of current issues around his like long term retirement or hiatus, I mean, it's, it's, it's up for discussion either way. It depends how kind you want to be to him, essentially. Um, but it certainly wasn't as comfortable or as attractive a listener as, as some of his more famous and earlier work. Um, yeah. I thought that his escape from Zarkham Asylum was was really good. It had everything you needed if you like this kind of music in times like the Saturday morning cartoon styles. It had in the background classic villain like villainous um tunes that you'll find in or villainous kind of sample on the underground beat that you'd find in something like vaudeville villain or food where they directly sample cartoon characters um 
and it almost had a kind of cinematic sound to it. And and again, the track was quite long, but I don't think it got boring. Um, I think Inspector Deck had, as usual, you know, um, very good bars. You get, you know, I think he's quite underrated compared to other members of the Wu Tang Clan, from what I've heard of them. Um, at least he's he's less renowned. Um, but yeah, I think I think that was overall a, a good track. Um, and I liked the kind of brass, the use of brass on it. It was very boastful. Um, esoteric almost sound like almost sounded like Jay Z on that track with the kind of intonation of his voice and the swagger in his in his kind of writing and and the kind of and his, the swagger of his kind of tone, um, which along with the brass and the heavy instrumentals, it did give a lot of a kind of classic early Jay Z vibe. Um, but yeah, I, I think overall it was a good album. I'd probably give it some, something like an eight out of ten or maybe a, maybe a, a a strong seven but yeah uh, jay what are your thoughts yeah i mean to an extent to probably even to a large extent i agree with a lot of what you said um also in the past week uh, just to join the club i listened to Mavalini and M food um M food for the first time um so obviously i couldn't help but compare this and i didn't think it held up to that comparison very well just because I think that it was, although it was an interesting album, I don't think it was as exciting or as fresh or maybe even as experimental as those other works, as the works by MF Doom and by, um, you know, Mad Villain. I felt that maybe the some of the more kind of cartoonish elements were slightly less pronounced in favour of a more kind of 90s underground rap sound, which maybe is why, you know, Arjun likes it. For me, it was just wasn't really my kind of thing. Like, don't wrong, I think this is a good album, but I think it's kind of treading on this. It's kind of talking about what we said earlier. It's treading on the territory of, you know, artists who have probably just made a similar album to a much higher quality. And I feel like I'd just rather listen to those instead. Yeah, I mean, that's completely fair enough. I mean, it it, it is obviously not that mainstream in that, although all of us kind of know MF Doom's work quite well we've got to remember that it's he's not like mainstream you won't find him on like the billboard or anything so people yeah. who aren't who aren't like fans of kind of a more underground sound um it's not really going to be up your street just just because of the premise of the kind of genre um cameron what, what were your thoughts uh yeah i thought this was uh, an excellent record i really liked the lyrics on it i really liked the production i particularly enjoyed some of the recurring concepts throughout uh, in particular, like you've all mentioned, the comic book theme, that Saturday morning cartoon vibe running through with the samples, uh, and also the professional wrestling um, references in tracks like Lumberjack Match and Sergeant Slaughter. I thought those were uh, those were quite welcome. It's not something you see in a lot of hip hop albums, and I thought they executed it quite well. Uh, in terms of standout tracks and features, I'd agree there that MF Doom here uh it might seem a bit almost a hesitant but phoning it in it's not his strongest work the uh the feature that really stood out for me was ra the rugged man on good villains go last i really thought his bars they were tight uh flow was excellent and it just sort of rounded off what was a brilliant album i'd have to give this one uh, an eight and maybe even a nine it's inspired me to well, I'll definitely check out a lot of Wu Tang's stuff because I'm quite unfamiliar with a lot of their work and uh, delve further into East Coast hip hop because, yeah, this was a brilliant album. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Arjun, well done. I think you you reached some kind of consensus. Um, yeah, as I say, it was it was a nice um, build. It was kind of nicely built on stuff I've been listening to this week. I'm looking forward to Zar to Zarface's collab with MF Doom. I I haven't listened to it yet, but I uh, do have the intention to, and we'll probably listen to it together. Yeah. Um, on that. Um, so yeah, I'll be looking forward to what to listen to that. Yeah, on that album, that album is much better than the track with MF Doom in it on this album. Like he doesn't phone this in it, phone this in at all. Um, yeah, that that's a really solid album, as is um, as is all of their work really. And in terms of Inspector Deck, he doesn't really have a a proficient or as good a solo discography as some other members of the Wu Tang Clan. But if you if you view this, um, if you view Zarface as, as part of his solo work in a way, um, then, it, then it really backs up his, his, um, the claims that he's quite underrated and very, uh, one of the all-time greats um, of the 90s and st stretching beyond. And the fact that, you know, when this album's made and now he's like a 25-year veteran of the game shows that he, you know, he's really good and, and still putting out quality work well into, deep into his career. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I think um, overall we, we've got some decent consensus there. 
Um, who's next? Yeah, Jay, let's go next with your massively controversial album. Here we go. So my pick for this week was Chart Mask Replica. Um, I've got to say, I actually hadn't listened to this until about a week ago for the first time. And I think I was on maybe track three or four when I messaged everyone. I was like, right, this is my pick for this week. For me, it was just such a no brainer. It was one of those albums that just clicked in me right away. So just to kind of, I just want to give kind of a bit of context about the album. It's, um, so it was written by Captain Beatfart. He basically couldn't play a piano and wrote every single song on a piano, which he couldn't create, and then handed it to his members of his band and said, right, I need you to translate these piano notes, which obviously make no sense, to whatever instrument you're playing, most of which did you physically couldn't translate from a piano to kind of a guitar or to a flute or whatever he gave them. And then they spent basically eight months recording this album, like um, rehearsing this album, meticulously planning every single note that you hear, um, basically being deprived of sleep. And then the end of product is basically this obscure, huge kind of blues jazz album that almost sounds like it was written by kind of a bunch of schizophreniacs. Um, You've got singing that is kind of sounding like it's from Scooby-Doo and from like South Park. You've got instruments which are just so out of tune but it all for some bizarre reason sounds brilliant and it sounds so great and it's so interesting. Um, I'm really interested to hear what you guys thought of it because I thought it was just such a fucking fantastic album. I'll let the other guys go go first but all I'll say is I just briefly I, I, I said to Jay that it it is essentially like the one hit wonder US rock band Ram Jam were on intense drugs and couldn't really hold their instruments properly. That's what it sounded like to me. That's not meant pejoratively, by the way. Um, Cameron, go. Uh, yeah, I have to echo Jay's opinion here. This is a excellent album. I really enjoyed this. I think I had the benefit of having listened to it before uh, a few years back. So I, I, I knew what I was getting into a little bit. Yeah. It didn't take me by surprise. Um, because I, I'm not going to beat around the bush. A lot of this album is out of tune. It's out of time. <laughs> you can't pin down any identifiable time signatures or key or melodies. But to me, that is the appeal of it. It is pure, ex- unadulterated experimentation. And for that reason, to me, that, that, that's why this album is timeless. You can't pin it down to any genre, to any time i mean it was made in 1969 it could have been made any year any time before that or any time after that uh, just because it is that mental it, it, it's a, it's fantastic i don't know any other album where you just have some guy singing these horribly out of tune blues lyrics or for some kind of mess around on a saxophone and bass clarinet it's fantastic i i really love this but i can obviously see why some people wouldn't like it and, and that's not as to say oh some people don't get this album that they, they, they're not educated or whatever like no no it, it, it's clearly a divisive album and it's i think they actually wanted it to be like that not everyone likes uh free jazz or avant-garde music and that's absolutely fine but to personally i love it i think it's great experimentation like <laughs> i think it's timeless it's wonderful so thank you for picking it jay i really like this you're there you welcome jay. Gold star from Cameron. Um, no, yeah. I, I think I think um, the um, the the intention was I think clearly quite provocative. Anyway, I think we can make a distinction between um, the attempt and the execution. Cameron seems to think both went brilliantly. Arjun, what do you think? This is probably the weirdest album I've heard, and but it's one I feel like it's one album that you you have to listen in one go. You can't really just pick a random song and be like, oh, okay, you know. You have to listen to it in one go and you have to listen to each song within the context of the album. But yeah, it was a really weird listen, but I do I really did enjoy it though. Um I just thought it was quite weird. Like my brain was sort of melting when there was no there was no sign of like any sort of structure or melody at all. I just, as soon as there was like a brief glimpse of one, I I, I felt at, at peace, but then it, it immediately went. So in that way it was quite a challenging listen. But um but yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed listening to it, but it was just a very, very odd album to listen to, personally. <laughs> yeah. Jay, you, do you have anything else to add about it? Well, I don't know. I felt like something I was kind of just echoing what Cameron said. It was something that kept kind of coming to my mind while I was listening to the album. Was I was almost imagining kind of being in the car with my parents and one of these songs coming on the radio and it honestly just made me laugh, the idea of it. It's just 
it's it's one of those things you kind of got to listen to to believe it it's so out there and I think in particular kind of what Arjun was saying I think I've listened to some of these songs kind of in isolation and in isolation they're just so funny but kind of in the context of the album it works and it kind of sounds completely different and it does weirdly work um, also, I think one of the interesting things I found about this album is David Lynch, who's one of my favourite filmmakers, has called it his favourite album of all time. And I mean, his films, for those of you who don't know, are kind of very surreal, very experimental. They're quite different from your standard films. And I think that this album is almost like a musical equivalent to that. And I think it's something that kind of just clicked with me on this kind of gut level. Um, but it's something that I could understand someone, not, someone kind of what, listening to and thinking, what the fuck is this shit? Well, I mean, I mean, like, like they're both kind of equally subversive, subverting yeah. kind of norms. And for the same reason, someone might not like or understand a David Lynch um, film. Someone equally might not like or understand this album. Yeah. Not even due to like kind of it being snobbery or whatever. It just some people just won't get it. You know, they just yeah. don't like it for whatever reason. Um, I mean, I personally didn't like it as much as you or Cameron did, but I, I didn't think it was bad by any means. I thought it was a very solid album. Um, I think I was actually, I actually, yeah, I did try and listen to some of the songs in isolation. And it's quite peculiar and bizarre how the songs are, are like so different in isolation compared to when you listen to them in the context of yeah. the album. Um, that's something that, although I've encountered it before in a positive way, in that, like, for example, songs on Kendrick Lamar's Good Kid, Bad City are much better in the context of the album and whilst so excellent are not as good in isolation. Mm. This was a completely different level where the song in isolation was <laughs> surreally almost a Gilbert and Sullivan level, just funny. And then, yeah. and then when you put them in the album, they become somehow more profound, and it's it's just really peculiar. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, I, I can't say have anything to, bad to say about the album. I completely understand why it was deemed to be preserved by the um, National Library of Li- Library of Congress in the United States. Um, it, it's iconic, and I, I completely um, applaud the artists for the creative choices, just because yeah. it was so so experimental. Well, it's it's kind of again like just to kind of as a final word. I feel like one of the things people always say is you know it's kind of impossible to do anything new, um, and that you're never going to listen to a song where you kind of haven't heard something somewhat similar in the past. And I feel like with this album, genuinely, I've never heard anything like any of these songs. It is just so out there. And it's so just completely unique in its own thing. And I've got to really respect it for that. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, and finally, Cameron, your turn. Uh, yeah, so my choice was The Lexicon of Love by ABC. It's their debut album and was released in 1982. Uh, and the reason I chose this is to sort of highlight a genre that's sort of gone by the wayside uh, in recent years and actually ever since sort of the mid to late 80s this type of music has sort of become less fashionable and it's the genre of sophistipop uh, that is taking the ideas from late 60s orchestral baroque pop and really fleshing it out in this maximalist production style using lush orchestral arrangements these really uh, yearning earnest lyrics and bringing it all together for this sort of grandiose statement whilst also in the back of its mind never really taking itself too seriously uh, if you allow me to just make a bit of an analogy here which I, I don't know if it's that apt but in a similar way to trout mask replica never really taking itself too seriously this album doesn't really yeah it uses all these you know orchestral real instrument productions and yes he sings about heartbreak and love but it's all a bit jokey at times and i think that's a bit of a quality it's lacking in pop music nowadays so i'm quite interested to hear what you thought of it as well yeah cameron just briefly before we move on to the others what what tracks specifically stand out to you and what what tracks do you think really exemplify what the album's trying to do uh the singles of this album are great poison arrow and uh, look of love are two of the 80s best songs in my opinion but uh even some of the choice album cuts as well like many happy returns or show me uh, just really fantastic, big, big statements uh, that I think are, are should should be a bit more well known. Jay. Yeah, um, I like this album. I thought it was it was when I listened to when I first heard the Look of Love, I was like, it was one of those songs. It's like, oh, I know this song. I've heard this before. Yeah, it's a classic. Um, but I obviously didn't know it was by them. I thought it was an interesting album. I actually think I preferred the second half of the album to the first half, um, because I felt like in the second half they were kind of being a bit more 
a bit more bold and a bit more interesting. You know, you had two songs which kind of exceeded five minutes. All of my heart, I thought, was actually one of the best on the album. It was quite like an intense listen. It was, you know, like a very big kind of almost like a borderline power ballad. Um, I really actually liked um, what was called Fiend for Man Trap, which I soon realised was basically just Poison Arrow slowed down. I actually preferred that version of the song. Um, I thought it was kind of a really good, although it wasn't on the original release, I thought it was actually worked as a really good closer to the album. Yeah, I liked it. I thought it was an interesting um, album. I thought there were some really good songs on it. Yeah, fair uh, enough. Yeah, yeah. Do you have anything else to add, sorry? No, not really, actually. Okay. Um, Arjun? Um, yeah, I feel bad. Nothing personal, Cameron, but I feel like every week your album tends to be the one I like the least. But yeah, I didn't really like this album, to be honest. I, I mean, I thought it was, I thought for, it, it was a decent listen, but once I went back and heard it again to like decide if I want to add any songs you know, to a playlist, I thought that there wasn't anything worth adding for me. I do agree with Jane that the second half was better um, than the first, like the B side. I like songs like All of My Heart were, as you said, like a power ballad, but I don't really enjoy the album, to be honest. I don't really have anything to say because I'm not really too knowledgeable about um, this type of like, like new wave synth pop, I, you'd call it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. fair, fair enough. I mean, it's, it's, uh, mu- music, is, music is subjective. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I guess I was add, add, add what I think. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. It's kind of really up my street. I do like this kind of wave of, of pop. As, as Cameron already knows, we share that interest. Um, I really like, obviously, Look of Love, absolute classic. Poison Arrow, absolute classic. Um, there are other songs like Tears Are Not Enough, All Of My Heart, which I'd obviously heard before, but I didn't realise were by them, as Jay kind of said. Um, and... It, okay, this is going to be a really weird comparison, but bear with me. It really reminds me a bit of Kanye's My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy in that it's a very expensive sound. It's very slick. It's very sparkly. Um, it's very suave. You can tell, and it's on like all the lights from Kanye. It, it, it really, you can tell in that song that Kanye has spent a long time, you know, curating this to almost be like a kind of theatre Broadway show with grand brass, grand instrumentals. It's very expensive uh, in the sound. And you get that kind of with this album too. It it really defines almost, I think, the decade that would follow, which is the kind of decadence of that, of that, of that decade. It's almost like a, you know, it's almost like if you're going from like 1970s, dreary, grey, economic hardship, black and white, and then you go into the 80s and it's all just technicolor and bright colors and just this album seems to exemplify that change for me you just go into the colors and it's bright sounds you know um just just kind of really expensive as i say um yeah and there are obviously some certified bangers i think it's a a classic album um i don't really know as much as cameron does about the genre the changes and um kind of synth pop and stuff and i'm i'm actually quite into getting into it a bit more but yeah it, it, unequivocally i think it it was a really enjoyable listen um I'd especially just note how um, it, it's, although it's um, quite decadent, that that makes it quite contrasting with albums of a similar time, which I think, like for example, Penthouse and Pavement, which Cameron chose before, seems to be slightly more minimalist, at least in its messaging, if not its music, um, which kind of bemoans perhaps the decadence of the 80s and the inequalities of society. And then contrasting that with this, which seems to revel in that kind of new technology and expensive sound and just kind of reveling in capital. Um, and I find that contrast really interesting because it just illustrates um, a lot of stuff about the zeitgeist of the time. And yeah, it almost makes me jealous, as usual, of my parents and the time that they grew up. <laughs> Cameron, I'm sure you have more to add. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll just say I completely understand the Kanye Dark Twisted Fantasy comparison, because obviously that is an album which is quite known for its maximalist production basically throwing everything at it and seeing what sticks with these rich soundscapes and that is definitely i think what they were going for here i will highlight in particular i think it was trevor horn's brilliant production work i think uh one of the best producers of all time uh definitely deserves more name recognition beyond the specky guy from buggles who did video kill the radio star he's a brilliant producer <laughs> He's 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 a brilliant producer, and I think that is a sonic uh, 
atmosphere or sound that you just don't see enough in pop nowadays. Obviously, you've got artists now like uh, Billie Eilish or Charlie XCX who try and take pop to these new minimalist heights, if you will. Uh, I, I don't think they execute it as well, even as some of the minimalist people from either synth pop or genres before that. But nowhere do you find this uh, th- this sort of maximalist sound anymore, and I think it, it really could be used nowadays. It's a it, it's it's an interesting sound that I, uh, you, you don't hear often. No, I think yeah, I think I think it's a shame as well. But but yeah, I mean, I, I entirely agree with the characterizations. However, I will not allow you to say a bad word about how I'm feeling now, which Jay introduced me to, which is Charlie XCX's new album. Um, yeah, I think I, I think it's I think it's a good album. And although I didn't like her last album, Charlie, I, Charlie, I thought was quite kitsch. I think this new album, How I'm Feeling Now, is a good album. So I'll not have you insult that, Cameron. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, no, no I, I, I exactly understand what you're saying. Um, but yeah, thanks, guys. That, that was a really interesting selection of albums. And I'm happy that we all chose something quite different. Um, I guess the last, last thing that remains is just to ask what you're going to be listening to this week. So Arjun. My answer is really the same as usual. I don't really have a clue, to be honest. I'll probably listen to a few more Wu-Tang solo albums with you, um, introduce you to them. Um, but on my own, I'll, I'll just pick them spontaneously, I guess. Uh, are you going to carry on with the hip-hop, or are you going to try and branch out? Um, I'll probably see what you guys um, pick for me this week, and I'll I'll go from there, I think. Fair enough. No, that's always, that's always good. Jay? Yeah, mine's the same. It's just gonna be random, sporadic, whatever I feel like at this on the spur of the moment. Yeah, fair enough. Are you gonna try and um, listen to a lot of different artists? You're gonna try and de- delve deep into one, like you did with the Radiohead. Uh, I normally kind of do a little bit of each. I probably will continue with Death Grips a little bit, um, but in general, I kind of like just mixing it up with genres and eras all the time. Fair enough. And Cameron. Uh, yeah, I'm planning on listening to the new Strokes album that was released this year. I've not had the chance to get around to it yet. I love the Strokes, uh, one of the best uh, new-ish indie bands. If you, I really like them, yeah. If, if, you, if you class 20 years ago as being new-ish, <laughs> sorry about that. But, um, <laughs> uh, specifically as well, I want to revisit um, one of my favourite bands, Kraftwerk. They recently released all their German version, uh, German lyric albums on uh, Spotify. So I want to get back in and listen to those. Fair enough. Yeah, I, the Strokes. I really like their album. Is this it? I've got a few of those. The album. I've got a few of the songs from that album on on my playlist. So yeah, that, that's a. I think a really good album. Um, but yeah, thanks guys. That was a really good pod. Um, a lot of interesting albums chosen. And yeah, I mean, uh, we'll see you next time on Waxing Lyrical from the Symposium. Thanks. <laughs>